Ms. Garces, how are you? Great, how are you? It's great, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Well, we're so glad you're able to come in in person. And I know you if, if you were still here, Senator Person would give you a special welcome. <laughs> well, uh, Senator Person oh, used to okay. sit here, yeah, yes. But if Senator Weeks were here, I'm sure he would give you a special <laughs> welcome as well. We're grateful uh, that uh, Ms. Garces is here to talk about the Human Rights Commission and give us an overview of uh, discrimination and harassment. And uh, I know you have provided us with a handout. And I apologize, you did reach out to me earlier to come in, and I'm sorry I didn't act on it faster. So we're glad you're here now. Oh, thank you. Thank you so thank much you. for having me. Um, and just so you know, Senator Weeks will be coming in. We just had our sexual uh sort of policy update, and right. he's running a little bit. So, right. so yeah, so I, uh, for the record, my name is Amanda Garces. I am the Director of Policy, Education, and Outreach for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. And I really wanted to give you an overview of how our commission works and uh, some of the things that we're working on. We think it's really important to just kind of have when you're talking about thinking about discrimination and thinking about public schools, just kind of a overall in that. Uh, so I gave you this really short presentation, one for me to yeah, give me in line. Um, we got a great preference. And so the commission has been around for about 30 years, and we have been the chosen entity to enforce the discrimination laws. Um, and we are an independent commission. Um, the, the, so I want to walk you through what we do. So we enforce the following discrimination law, the Fair Employment Practices Act, and this focuses more on state employees. So if an employee is retaliated against because they took co-workers' compensation or parental leave or they want a flexible working condition, or they're just being discriminated against. Um, that's that is in our jurisdiction. If they work for in a private employer, then they go to the attorney general's office. Um, our next one is the Public Accommodations Act, and that is really broad, which is great for Vermont. We enjoy a very broad definition of public accommodations and. Yes, the first stage. And our courts have uh, held up places of public accommodations also include governmental entities. In our statute, say the place the places of public accommodations includes any school that brings in cases that also brings uh, cases from inmates, police brutality. So it's really broad. Um, and we also see cases against hospitals or clinics and so forth. So that's our jurisdiction. Could you say and a little bit more about that while we're on it? So everyone has to follow all businesses, government, schools, everyone, public, independent, has, has to follow the public accommodation. Yes, no. Any, anybody, so it's with anybody that has, you know, is providing a service to people. In the state of Vermont. In the state of Vermont. Okay. So that's our state statute. Okay. And so give us some examples of what that would include. So that includes an inmate who is not getting service at a, at a correctional facility. You know, we had a case uh, with someone who was not providing hearing aid. Um, we have cases where um in restaurants if they're not being served because they're black or latino that that is a place of public accommodation so any anything that's providing a service to the people of so if you're so as we're the education committee i can see of course some of those things could could come up with faculty and staff at any school but how does it relate to is it related all to educational opportunities or offerings for example you know if your child well does it in any way so harassment in yep. school is our jurisdiction okay. and and so if any child is being harassed because of a protected category that okay. goes into uh into there 
I think for uh, teachers who are, that they go to the attorney general's office because they are, those are considered private employers. Okay. So that is not our jurisdiction. Uh, students with disabilities also are not our jurisdiction within within a piece like they was like an IEP related. Um, and, and so let's say that you have a student that is not allowed to join a student group yeah. and like the school staff is providing that support, then that, you know, they could come to us. Um, we've had cases where, and Rachel has more cases than <laughs> Remember on the education outreach now, but so in terms of schools, we have a lot of harassment cases that come through. You do. Or, okay. Yeah. And, and we've seen an increase of those. That's, that's the, so with the IEP, for example, if a school doesn't follow the, let's say I had a child in third grade, they had an individualized education plan, the school didn't follow it, for example. Do I as parent have then the ability? Is that what? No, okay. but I, I think that, no, the IEP is called like the agency of education. There's okay. Like the whole is special education plan. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if, uh, they're, if they are not providing some IEP because they're black, Thank you. because it okay. is related to its protected category, okay. and that that is considered discrimination, that is a little different. But not like not following the IEP or not doing like that a structural pieces of the, the special education law. So, Senator Blaine, you said I, I may have misunderstood what you said, but you said something about hearing aids. Yes. Can you say that again? Yes, yes. So we had a case uh, in one of the prisons where an inmate was not getting their hearing aids. That is in, based on disability, so that places a public accommodation not providing that service, that support okay. for that. So that, that was one of the cases that we have okay. in, in your report. You'll see that one of the losses. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the Third piece is the Fair Housing Act, and that's uh, self-explanatory anybody that is being discriminated against uh, because of protected care around housing. This could include even harassment neighbor to neighbor. Um, and we have some cases on that. Uh, so that's kind of like our statute. Um, we also have some of gender neutral bathrooms that we oversee, which passed in Act 127. And here's a list of all kind of our protected categories and how um, they are related to each of our three statutes. So you could see, you know, rates is in housing, public relations, state government. Sorry. Yeah. What, is, what is the uh, law on gender neutral bathrooms? Because I've seen, I, think, I thought I understood it, but I go around different places, uh, restaurants, and, and they all have a different. Uh, you know, I think there was a symbol that was supposed to be used. Yeah. Everybody, right? So they, they're supposed to have single use restaurants who have the general neutral okay. usage. So if they have one single stool, they have like both. Okay. So that's actually good for them. Some yeah. places only had one bathroom. They used to have to have a male and female bathroom. <laughs> so now they're only. Okay. And so they have to have the sign. So people can send us. And I'll just say, hey, I went to this restaurant and they don't have it. And then we'll send a letter to them and try to get them to do it. Okay. So the way that our enforcement works is um, people put a complaint and the, our, the, the agency will receive the, the complaint. Uh, we will open up an investigation. So that goes to our attorneys. We have six attorneys, oh, no, six employees. We have six staff, uh, our executive director, their assistant, uh, myself, and then three uh, staff attorneys. So they, they begin an investigation. Through all this time, they, they can uh, start negotiation proceedings for settlement to try to settle the case at all of these stages. Uh, they issue a report uh, that will say we find reasonable grounds or not. And that report is given to the commission that meets once a year. There's six commissioners that have commissioners that are appointed by the governor, and they look at these cases on a monthly basis. 
And if so, again, like through all this time, there's trying to have settlement agreement. And then once they get up to the commission, if they found reasonable grants, that they can, uh, that it goes back to our executive directors for either try to settle the case so then that you, within, I forget how many days, and then um, if not, they go through litigation. So we have some cases in litigation and you can see in the report, a lot of a lot of that. So, in terms of education, I come in, like we also are part of how we claim investigation. We also do a lot of act uh, proactive work. We sit on a bunch of uh, workforces. Uh, I sit. I the chair the Brand Impartial Policing Committee. I chair the Act One Working Group. Um, and you know we have some colleagues that are the Criminal Justice Council. And then I also sit in the Asian Board and Harassment Council. Um, and so a lot of the work that we are doing is proactive, education and outreach. We do inclusive ice training, like center intervention, um, and, and then trying to push you know, our culture shifts in, in our education system as well. So there are um, a few things that you can do <laughs> and in terms of education that we think is really important is to kind of look at our bullying harassment cases. Like I said, those harassment cases have increased. Uh, it could be, you know, part of because of the work that we're doing around Act One and moving that work, but also because of the outreach and education that we do with a lot of our grassroots organizations that are in Vermont around education. And um, we have some really specific suggestions for the agents of education to kind of hire someone that can lead a bullying harassment uh, campaign that can support cultural shifts in our schools, um, included independent schools. Do you have that those recommendations? No, no. I okay. don't. Okay. Uh, but I can send them. That'd be great. Yeah. 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 Um, I th I think that one of the things that we also see is that bullying, for example, doesn't have a way. Like so, harassment cases can come to us, but bullying cases have clear channel outside of the school district. So having a channel for students who are being bullied that is independent as well will be really important. And then there's just a need to have more conversations about how that sh that cultural shift. But you don't deal with, with the bullying now. Mm -hmm. You said they're going to start channeling bullying through you too. No, 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 no. no that's not. We, we're saying that there needs to exist oh, another okay. channel, but not necessarily us. Okay. Uh, it could be the agency of, of education have any different thing channels for that. So one of the, um, there's a bill in the house that is coming up right now uh, by the percentage coach Christie, that is to change one thing in our harassment uh, laws, which is the pervasive, severe and pervasive law. So we passed the house last year and it basically is uh, clarifying the standard around severe and pervasive. So one example is uh, when to prove severe and pervasive in the harassment laws, you have to really, really have a level of severe, right? Like, so you have to, if you are a woman and you touch your breast at your work, that is not considered severe and pervasive. If you have a coworker that's asking you over and over again, don't hate and you're saying no, that is not considered severe and pervasive. And so what we're trying to shift this to be able to allow for more people to come to our court and to give this opportunity for people who are experiencing what the courts might say that is not severe. So um, that those things over there, but I would love for you to think about like how to support that and I can't look, we can send you more details about what that looks like. I have a question. What is what would the alternative standard be um, compared to the severe and pervasive or pervasive standard? So that what we have right now is yeah. the severe and pervasive, yeah. right? And it just it has a high bar. Mm -hmm. So for someone to come into the door, you have to just I don't maybe Rachel can talk more about what it looks like because 
an attorney at Legal Aid. Hi. Do you want me to, for the record, I'm Rachel Sealing. I'm the director of the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. Um, so the, the, if the, the question is like, what does severe and pervasive look like? Um, I can give an example of a student with a hearing impairment who um, is continuously um, ignored by classmates or teased by classmates or called names by classmates because of their use of an assistive device for hearing. Um, or I can give an example of a student with a disability who is also biracial, who is sometimes teased because of their disability and sometimes because of their race and sometimes because of their gender. We would view that as severe or pervasive. Um, whether the Office of Civil Rights or the Human Rights Commission can, can conclude that really depends on the evidence available. But um, oftentimes it starts with words and then becomes physical. Um, and what we often see is that the student who's being targeted finally responds and then they are the ones who are removed from the situation rather than the students who have been targeted. So what, so if the severe or pervasive standard was removed, what would the alternative be? So we had some language that passed through the house last year that would lower the standard. And I apologize, not remember, do you have the specific words that we had last year, Amanda? But essentially it would be more than kind of minimal or annoying. Um, but it would be, you know, so that a child doesn't have to, you know, go through three or four or five or six incidents of being, you know, the target of their peers before they can have their their district take a look at the situation, say, yes, it's harassment, and then do the education and do the kind of, whether it's restorative practices or, or other kind of positive behavior interventions and supports, uh, our hope is that it's an educational process and, and the students learn. Um, and if that still doesn't work, then move on to kind of more disciplinary consequences. But we're also working very hard to ask you to not let kids be removed from school for disciplinary reasons. And so it's it's a, it's it's all connected in, in, in our view. Yeah. Right. So are the incidents that you just talked about on the increase decreasing yes. or are they no, they're very much increasing. Yeah. Yes. I, I think we've gotten six intakes that have to do with harassment or bullying in the last week and a half. I mean, it's it's that may be a little bit of an overstatement, but it's it's quite frequent that families are calling us and feeling like their schools just don't have the capacity to address it because schools are overburdened. Um, and I, and I think that so the part is like that we need to really look at this as in a holistic way. You know, the HRC is a, it's an enforcement agency and we don't represent students, right? So like the, so they usually go through right. us. If there's a disability, if it's disability, sometimes it's so That's right, I stepped out. So you're with. I run the disability law project at Vermont Legal Aid. Okay. I did put myself on the record. No, 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 I just, yeah. no, I apologize. I apologize. Like, I apologize. Yes, no, I'm glad you pulled her. Yes, no, I'm glad. I was like, I told her she could if she wanted to. Great, that was great. That's great. Uh, and um, so, yeah, I, I think it's looking at this from a holistic perspective, you know, the work that is happening around like mental health and what is needed, like it can't be alone. It has to be. It has to be connected to all these things. Like, well, how are we dealing with bullying and harassment? We can just pass the policy and leave it. Like, but how, what is the support, the training? Um, we are kind of working to with the Office of Virtual Equity to come up with a training for students and families to not your rights um, around not your rights and you know waiting for the agency to give us an update policy. I think that so. There is ways that the Senate can really support students right now by saying this is important to us because we know that there's an increase and many families feel hopeless. And so I can bring many here that say, you know, I, I don't know what the password is. So I'm just kind of pleading for them to let's look at this in a human level. As you're having this conversation about the public dollars, that we're also looking about how we are supporting our families in our public schools as well and in the public schools that are dealing with this i think it's great that you're looking at it because i think it's more prevalent than a lot of people realize i think you know my my daughter 
she used to come home from crying every night because of this group that she wanted to be a part of was picking on her all the time. It wasn't one, really one of them. And I mean, it really has a devastating effect on these students. Yeah. Ms. Garces, last year uh, we passed a bill uh, with Senator Ron Hinsdale and Senator Sears' bill that's uh, no more suspensions, expulsions up to, I think, no one under, I think it was third grade or something like that. Third grade. Yeah, or. And actually, it was age eight. It was age eight, that's yes. right. Okay, okay. Do we know how, do you have any sense of what's happening out there in your ex I, you know, again, I know you're not representing students, but anything that you're hearing from your side of things. I, I don't. You want me to answer? Yeah, yeah, please, absolutely. So, um, first, we have a whole um, proposal that we would love to talk, about, uh, talk to you about, Great. kind of following up on Act 35 yeah. um, and that work group. In terms of the removals of children under eight, we are still seeing it happen. Yeah. Um, we are seeing families being told it's not for disciplinary purposes, but you can't bring them back because we don't have staff or we need to set up a program for them. And we've had students out of school for months, months, because the staffing of the staffing shortage and they're not willing to allow the child in. So we're still seeing it with children under eight. Um, and I think we're actually seeing because of staffing shortages, schools feeling like they have to revert back to more um, discipline, traditional discipline instead of positive behavior interventions and supports, reinstituting things like detention, after school detention and school suspensions, just separating students that have become behavior problems rather than working on meeting the needs to help them deal with those behaviors. And so some of what I think we would love to talk with you all more about are things like additional teacher training, additional funding at the agency to have an expert on safe and inclusive schools to support the, the districts, um, much better data collection on the use of restraint, seclusion, exclusionary discipline, um, and kind of more longitudinal and more, you know, with more of a, a equity-based lens to it. Uh, and, and so we've got a whole bunch that we'd love to, to come talk more about because unfortunately, um, just saying, no, you can't suspend children under eight doesn't mean children eight and under aren't being pushed out if there's an issue. And I know from the school perspective, it's actually been a challenge because of the third grade thing. They have some eight-year-olds and some nine-year-olds. And so why are the eight-year-olds getting treated differently than the nine-year-olds? Um, I would welcome that. Um, we'd you know, love to, to get on the schedule. Crossover. After, you can yeah. work with, with Hayden. Uh, you know, we know that there is... Texas did the study, you know, school to prison pipeline. Yes. If you're suspended and ex or expelled, you know, you get behind, it's tough to get caught up, you start acting out, you drop out. I mean, I think the evidence is the evidence is incredibly clear. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the question is how can we help our schools meet the need absolutely rather than excluding students? Yeah. So I and I yes. You, you said of um, Act 68. Is that Act, um, Act 35. 35. Okay. Yeah. And they did, they did a report. They did do a report, mm -hmm. and the, your counterparts on the house did hear from some of the people who worked on the report um, earlier. Uh, I think maybe early, yeah, I guess earlier this month. And I think those same folks would be happy to come in and talk about the report, and you know, talk about what we think are good next steps. So. Yeah, and it would also be great to understand whether or not, um, and this is a little bit of your work, but. Back to the bullying piece, how hard is it for a kid to get out of a school? I know Representative Sevilla has a bill that could allow you, I think, to, if there are five elementary schools in that district, bam, put you in another one, you know, make a little, you know, be able to, without a lot of sort of formal action, given the severity that, that bullying can. I think there are risks of disparate treatment with those especially for students with disabilities, yeah. having another school have the choice to take them or not take them um, because of their level of need. And I can tell you from my work, uh, the only situation where I was able to move a high school student from one public school to another public school, not in the same district, because okay, they sure. multiple. Yeah, yeah. 
was a, a situation where they were so scared of the school they couldn't walk out their front door. Yeah. Now we heard from the state last week. There's a family had to move. Yeah, we've definitely had families move for yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And and we do have a lot of them. So part of the work that I do as an education outreach is kind of hear all these stories so that I can then like before they even come to the HRC to get a case, try to support them in other ways, negotiating with the schools to see if we can move them. And uh, so there's a team of other organizations that support parents. Once the case, if the, there's a case that comes through them, I kind of remove myself. But um, we try to support some of these families uh, to see, you know, what can happen, and so they feel supported. In some of these districts, there's not enough type of folks who can support and that can understand uh, what is happening to the family. So it's, it's really, you know, still prevalent. And I do want to just encourage that when we're, we need to look at the holistic picture of all the cases and yep. which is an excellent resource. Uh, <laughs> you're so <laughs> <nice>. <laughs> Well, I, I'm always with the of you, but um, because, I, you know, I think that the attorneys kind of know, like, the case is a lot more, a, a lot of the prevalence, so we have more of a view that we know that cases are increasing, yeah. and and a lot of, so when you look at the bullying and harassment data, mm -hmm. also, like, we don't see all those cases that settle, that's not what yeah. we see, so that data, when we're looking at it, we're, I'm like, wait, I know these cases, but they got settled. Um, so the, you're not seeing that. Nobody's seeing that. That so the the cases actually are higher than what we see in the data. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, this yeah. is uh, such a, a broad issue that isn't um, unique to schools. I mean, three of us are at health and welfare, and we're talking about. Um, folks in the healthcare system who, well, many of whom are not getting the care that they need, but also healthcare workers who are being assaulted. And so it's just, it's a really difficult moment in history, I think, just because they're uh, just the way we're treating each other as human beings. And um, we're seeing it in this building. I yeah, yeah. I, I want to say thank you to both of you. Rachel's already helped me <laughs> in another issue before. So. Um, you are there for the folks who don't have a voice and who are often unheard, and it's really important work, and I, I just really can't thank you enough for what you do. It's, it's an extreme when an individual student and the family have to move, yes. and we still have the problem because the only thing that changed is that individual student left, right. and we don't address the issue, the real problem. The right. culture. Right. Yeah, there's a cultural shift that needs to happen. And, you know, I, I am really supportive of all the schools and the educators. It's not easy, right? It's not right. easy. It's so and, you know, we don't have enough mental health support. We don't have enough special educators. So, like, we understand. Uh, but, you know, that we should always increase advocacy and ensure that if things are not working, that we shift systems. And so like for me, creating this very pervasive piece around supporting, you know, like students that might not have a case. So here's a personal story. When I was 16, moved to the U.S., didn't know English, was in a school, you know, was bullied for about three months. Um, and one day I lost it. And, and I got up. You know, I was like, who are you talking to? I threw a paper on the floor, you know, and uh, the teacher was like, oh my God, did you see a therapy? I was like, oh my, <laughs> you know, like, so, but that's, that's what it was. It was like three months. And then when I was taken to the principal office, one of the students came and was like, no, yeah, like, they, the teacher never noticed that they were bullying her for like, I was sitting next to her, but nobody had done anything, right? So, like those, those are the cases where we see a lot of this behavior and then the person that has been bullied kind of loses it. And then because there was not that process in place to support them or like feel seen. So I think uh, it's very dear to my heart. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, so. There's no something. consequences. Yeah, there's consequences. You gotta carry all of that with you.
thank goodness for therapy. <laughs> but yeah, so this is uh, just in a way to start the conversation about what is the holistic shift that we need to make and support our systems to be better for well, all right, so one last question. Sorry, yeah. Chair. No, please go for it. Um, since we're talking about systems, um, do what's the, what is the role of parents in like systemic change? Do you ever bring them in in terms of, yeah, and trying to educate? Because it, it, you know, we're all connected in yeah. various ways. I mean, she's your witness, so I want to give her a chance. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> you're my witness. So, the first thing I would say is that. When it comes to students with disabilities, Vermont has, as every state is required to, a state special education advisory panel that is required to have a majority of the members be either people with disabilities or parents of students with disabilities. And I've been on that panel for the last several years. And, and for the first time, I think, ever in the history of Vermont, our chair is now a parent of students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So that is a, an important way for the agency and the board to be getting advisement on areas of unmet need for students with disabilities and I can guarantee I promise you we've been talking a lot about restraint seclusion exclusionary discipline harassment and bullying um, the, the workforce shortage those are all topics that are on that agenda on a regular basis and I think that our chair would be very happy to come in and talk about the work that we're doing and what we think you all could do uh, to help support that work um, <laughs> You know, parents have a, have certain rights um, under the IDEA for participation, and they have the right to things like parent training and that sort of thing. And I think there is very much room to improve um, access to parent training and um, true incorporation of parent view into these processes, not just for IEPs, but when issues of bullying and harassment, when a student becomes dysregulated and they're subject to restraint seclusion, and in terms of the exclusionary discipline process, you know, the, the due process rights that have been established by the Supreme Court, which are what we have in Vermont, we don't, we haven't gone above that bar, are fairly minimal. And I think a lot of parents don't even realize when they're having their informal hearing before their student is suspended. So I think there's there's work that we could do um, to improve the, the parent role um, in many of these issues and the inclusion of parents at the district level and at the school level. Yeah. And, and I think so. Act one, you know, plays a lot of yes. view on the parents' role too, especially mm -hmm. when it comes to like the education. It comes to curriculum for communities that might not have that many people of color or people from the LGBTQ community. So like supporting that work on it. And there's some really great examples of uh, families who have gone through a bullying or harassment who created them equity committees. So like, I think there are tools in there where some schools are doing great and have equity committees that are, have parents involved that do some education around the community processes. Some are not there yet. So I think there's um, hopefully, you know, more work around that. that. There are things in place where, you know, site councils where they can have the knowledge of the parents to support. Thank you. Great seeing both of Thank you. you. And you'll email Hayden. We'll have you back yep. after I'll do that right now, Hayden. Yeah. yeah. And I will email you. Great. Uh, the pervasive, severe and pervasive, in case you guys want to add it somewhere. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll actually. So tell us a little bit what would you like us to add exactly? So this is the language change. And the language on the, on the harassment. Um, and then it passed already on the house. Uh, last year in the in the fair housing. Oh, bill. so it wasn't in an education bill. No. Okay. No. But so we need to add it. We need to correct the standard in the education okay. in the public accommodations act, okay. actually, which will include you know education the schools. So that's how we add. And then we need to also add it um, in the wait the in the fair employment. So like the three, we're trying to correct them with all the three. Um, Okay. So. We have our alleged counsel behind you. Ms. St. James, is this? Damian Leonard. Damian yeah. Leonard, okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and, but it is education law that Damian would be edited? Would be. Uh, I haven't seen the bill. Uh, yeah. Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Counsel, I haven't seen the bill um, recently. 
if memory serves, I don't know. I don't want to speak to that. Sure. But because we're dealing with public accommodations and the okay. trickle down of that related to the hazing, harassment, and bullying policies, mm -hmm. Damien is taking the lead on that. Okay, so there is something out there right now. And do we know where it is right now? So the house, it, the house has a bill now okay. that was just yesterday got a number by Representative Coach. And I yeah. believe uh, Senator Rump wanted to do something, but I have not seen it. Okay. So when I, I, I can. When you see her, one option for us is always if it's if it's something, like, I don't know if it could go or should go into a miscellaneous education bill, but just know that that's a vehicle for us for the next couple of weeks. And I can touch base with Senator Rump and she'll also, I, I don't know if it's, if it just wouldn't mesh there for some reason, but. We do, I, I, we do have yes. a vehicle I, if, it, if it makes sense. I would love that vehicle. Okay. And I, I will it's check my favorite vehicle. And, you can yes, add anything yes. almost to it. <laughs> but um, yes, it, it will be changed to their public accommodations, which will okay. include schools. Okay. So, that is like, so before we vote out the miscellaneous education bill, in fact, next week, why don't we have uh, Ms. Garces in again? just so we have the language and we'll have Damien Leonard in with you also. Right. And that would be an opportunity for us to amend accordingly. If again, Perfect. but he may come back and yeah. say, hey, you know, this really has to go in a different way. Yeah. You know, miscellaneous education, the thing about the miscellaneous education bill that I worry a little, if it's very serious policy, I want to make sure, not that there are things in this land that are not serious, but there are different levels of seriousness. Yeah. Well. And I want to make sure it's the respect that it needs, and it may need to travel on its own. Great. Thank you. And if I'm not here, my uh, executive director uh, will be here. Who's your uh, Boria. Oh, yes. And she's uh, yeah. actually much more. <laughs> Oh, you will. Oh, have a great time. But I will. I I will make that. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Amelia. You. Good Thank to you see so you. Much. Always good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. 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 We're looking at the school safety bill, and we're looking at a new version that we hope will leave us next week. Uh, and it does occur to me that, having heard from uh, Ms. Carsis, uh, that it, it, we should make sure that you know the human rights campaign. Uh, the uh, ACLU, others are kind of following and tracking this work with Human Rights Commission, which they oh, usually do on their own, but maybe we should just reach out to the ACLU in particular. Do we have your card? Yes. Okay. I can, I can get that touch. Just to make sure that everybody is on the same page as we move forward. The same James. Good afternoon, that's in Ian's Office of Legislative Council. So just follow up on the conversation we were Please. just having. I um, found the bill you all were discussing um, related to the uh, definition of severe and pervasive um, and harassment. It is H uh, 359. Okay. Um, and what is it living right now? Do you know? It was just introduced. It was just introduced. Oh, well, let me tell you where it was referred. It was so referred to general and housing. Okay. It does make, it does amend, um, and I think I looked at this language a long time ago, um, it does uh, propose an amendment to the definition of harassment in Title 16 okay. to be consistent with that definition in other areas of the Vermont statute. And Title 16 is something we all know well, Jen. so is that, in your opinion, something we could amend in a miscellaneous education bill saying that this is or should it all be done to keep it all together, if you will? Um, it is certainly, it's that many Title 16 is certainly within your purview Her, and jurisdiction. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how that is done, I think, is a policy decision. Right. Um, having piecemeal amendments doesn't feel great. Um, but is, there's nothing illegal about sure, that. Sure, sure. Um, but that is a consideration. Yeah. 
So if you'll talk to Senator Ron Hinsdale and I'll try to talk to her and maybe we uh, see where the bill is. And it would make sense if, if you could touch base with the House Committee to make sure that they are going to move this soon if it's a priority. If you believe, if you end up feeling like you want that section that is our jurisdiction, Title 16 amended, for example, they may say, because it's late, crossover, I mean, I don't know if they're going to take this up, you know, in the next two weeks, eight days, basically. Um, if you can wait till next year, okay, but if you'd rather have it just amend 16, let us know. Okay. So we'll leave that with you. Great. Right. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, yes, and Dee Barbic, uh, delighted you're here in the World Wide Web out there. Thank you. Yeah, great. So we are going through in, uh, Ms. Barbara, do you have the most recent copy of the miscellaneous of the uh, school safety bill? Yes, I do. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you. You should have draft 3.1 with today's date on it in front of you. Bye-bye, Lizzie. You all have more yeah. okay, great. Um, the changes between uh, really draft 1.1 but also 2.1 and this draft are highlighted in yellow. I made one highlight in, I think it's debatable whether that's blue or green. It was blue on my computer screen. Um, uh, just as a, uh, there was a policy decision to be made there with the use of the word template, but um, the changes between yesterday and today are very minimal. Um, I don't know if you want me to walk through them or you want to get right into the policy questions you left on the table. I'd like you to walk this Sure. Um, page, um, so we're looking at section one, amendment to section 1481, the fire emergency preparedness drills on page two. Um, in response to testimony you received, um, and because this is all new language, you're not going to see a strike through for the changes. You're just going to, I get to delete it as, as I like. Um, so each school district board that operates a school shall adopt a policy that used to be the supervisory union. And um, I went ahead and made on line three, I went ahead and added the S to drills based on a conversation yesterday about um, uh, singular versus plural and what the singular excluded. And then we added the words at each school site. Uh, in the, oh, and there's in the, I didn't even catch that, in the, in the. I'm sorry, there. where are you catching? And on page three, yeah. in the fall, there's two in the, in the, uh, so line three, page yep. two. Yes. In the fall and spring of each academic year. Um, so I'll obviously fix that. And then template was a policy decision. On, right. There was some um, back and forth. Back and forth on that. And then um, the sentence was added in issuing the guidance to the Vermont School Safety Center and the Vermont School crisis planning team shall include trauma-informed best practices for implementing options-based drills. That language did not supplant anything. Uh, else Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, up on line two, sorry, I um, didn't have a chance to, to speak up um, at that point. Um, the op Each school district board that operates a school, I'm just wondering if operates is the correct term there, and I'm sorry because I know that you switched it from supervisory union, but um, I believe that that I don't. So this is the the base language here was drafted not by me. So I, I don't want to speak to the intent of the drafter. But the way I interpreted this is there are every school district, um, not every school district operates a school, right? Those are the sending districts, and so operates a school is a term we is a phrase that we use to talk about. You could certainly say maintains a school. Um, I think that's a commonly used term, but that to me, I read that as um, if you are not tuitioning your kids because you have a school. Gotcha. Okay. So it's not actually operating. It's, that's sort of a term of art that's used in the law. Um, I think, are you asking or asking? When you say operates, are you asking? Are you asking if it's a term of art related to, to this particular situation or in general? 
in in this situation or in the law. I, I'm only asking because I, I just have to laugh as, a, as someone who is on the school board. We, we constantly make the point that we're not operational. So <laughs> I'm just. Um, so I think that um, the recommend. So it's the school district that's operating the the school, um, and ever you know it's the voters. The I understand that there's there's the. Um, I understand that the, the administration of the school is during the day-to-day -day operation. Um, I believe that this is meant, again, to differentiate between a school district that has brick and mortar schools and that doesn't. Yeah. Again, you could use the word um, maintain. You could also, um, because it's the school district board that's adopting the policy and not the administration of the school that's adopting the policy, I think the saying school district board is important because they are the ones that are adopting the district wide right, policy. Absolutely, yeah. Um so well, maybe if, the other experts weigh in on that. But to me maybe maintains could be a better word there. But that's fine. I, I mean legally and I, I think that's fine. Other so, experts what do you think you can do it? I don't know like the um maybe like a superintendent or maybe Sue Sablowski wonder what she would think of the word. I mean, I'm, I, I've heard them both operate and maintain. Okay. So if you're more comfortable, I'm just looking around the room, is anybody pretty okay with, I mean, would you, are you comfortable with maintains or would you just want to, you can think about it, whatever. Yeah, I'm comfortable with whatever, because I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer. So I'm, if, if someone like Sue Sabowski said Martine operates as the word that we use okay. in this case, then I would be fine with it. I just, in my mind, I'm thinking it's funny that we always say we're not operational, and then I see the word operate, but I know it's not operate. It's not, mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. So I am, I'm flexible on uh, that. For what it's, so what we can do with this, of course, we will be doing is next week, we'll hear from everybody else. Right. Sue will be in again, and if she, uh, we can just make sure that everybody just comes with operates. Sure. I'm, I'm fine either way. I will just note that they, yeah. um, in the, Feedback provided by the Vermont School Board Association, the Superintendents Association, the Principal Association, that wasn't a suggested change. Um, okay, so. And we'll see them again, so we okay. you know we should just make sure that they're okay with it. Um, and then the next change occurs on page three, line 15. So before we get there, um, did, we, did we end up, and this might be dealing with it, did we, and D, I don't know if this is a question for you. Are we all in agreement that independent schools are part of this conversation? Is that yes. Okay. Yes, sir, they are. Right. So the the way that the discussion left off last time yeah. was that that was a that was a TBD. Um, so I haven't heard any direction otherwise. Sure, no, that's okay. That. So we have Pete Barbic right there, and I think what we were wondering was. Uh, we had thought that the agency of education, it was just an oversight that we're going to treat the publics and the independents the same way as it relates to this. And I, and D is shaking your head saying yes. So we want to make sure that that is consistent with all of our schools. Okay. So, um, for on page two, yeah. the subsection B, there is already a section, um, requiring approved and recognized independent schools to conduct the responses, the drills. I think the policy decision was whether or not they needed a policy. And we want, and okay. the agency of education wants the same policy for everyone. And I see you get shaking your head, yes. And I don't see any disagreement here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, section two on page three. The next change is on line 15. And that is an addition of the word local in front of emergency management officials. So, so Senator Williams' point. Section three on page three, line 20. Uh, there's, so this is about access control and visitor management policy. And so again, this is a change based on the testimony from the V. Each supervisor union, and then the new terms are member district board or supervisory district board shall adopt the policy. And it's all of them because the supervisory union district offices are also required to have uh, policies. So it's all of them. Okay. 
That was the last change. So the, the outstanding, again, this will maybe hopefully leave us next week. As you'll see next week's agenda, we are focused just on really what's on that board for the most part, say maybe one or two little things. Uh, can we return to template? And would you remind us on page two, line five, the debate over that word? If you don't remember, I can. I can certainly, yes. The, um, there's no commentary um, in the testimony from uh, the bees on why they wanted that change, so I can't speak to it. But there was discussion yesterday about uh, there, there being a template and whether template was the right word to be used. Does anybody have some thoughts on this? I mean, the reason I thought template was the right thing, but I could be wrong, was that if we would have consistency in every school, so if all of a sudden you got transferred to a different school or you took a new job, you have that. Dean, did you have your hand up? I did, sir, if I, if I could. Um, so I think the words guidance and template are just reversed in this document, depending on what it's referring to. So in other words, the emergency operations plan that is a template that's on the Vermont School Safety website. The um, drill guidance um, should be that guidance. So under the drill section that like page two, where we were just talking about yeah. um, the policy, looking at line four, the policy shall require that drills be conducted following guidance developed by and so with the drills, it's guidance. With the emergency operations plan, it's a template. And where do you see the uh, emergency operation plan? Just so I. I don't. I don't well, uh, uh, somebody, I give me a minute to find that exact wording. Okay, so it's correct. So on page three, um, line 16, shall maintain a, the Vermont school. And again, I'm gonna um, connect with Secretary French um, once he has an opportunity to see this as well. But um, the on line 16, the Vermont, it currently reads the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team shall maintain a template emergency operations plan. That's correct. So the emergency operations plan is a template. But going back to page two that we were just looking at, the drills are under a guidance, not a template. And that's consistent with what the bees also have asked for. Yeah. Center weeks. No, I agree. Okay. Okay. Yeah, one question. Yeah, I anticipated this. That's why I called on you. <laughs> so, so. so on page three, line five, is it how routine is it for one arm of the government to find another arm of the government? And what's you know, the net effect? Is, is, this, is this a routine? Uh, Which branch of government is finding? So it says a school district on page three, line three, school district independent school or educational institution whose administrative personnel neglect to comply with the provisions of the section shall be fined no more than $500. And the question is, you know, that back and forth. I guess I'm confused as to what, right, the legislature builds laws that fine all kinds of, uh, builds in fines for all kinds of not following the law. Okay. But, I mean, wouldn't it be the agency of education imposing a fine on a school district? Wouldn't that be? That's what it looks like. Yes, yeah, so like this is about independent schools. This is current law. Yeah. Okay. Um, so without doing any research, I don't know how old it is, yeah. or I agree that on its face it doesn't say who's doing the collecting. Um, but it's not uncommon for there to be a carrot or a stick when there are rules that are being required to follow. But this this has been in law for some time. Thank you. Thank you. Nope. No. Okay. Uh, 
Ms. Barbic, uh, any other comments or questions from you or anything else you were uh, going to weigh in on? We are, we are, we're not, we're gonna have Ms. Simmons from the agency in next week, uh, but I think the agency from one email exchange is feeling pretty good about the direction of things. I know you're gonna to talk to Secretary French. Yes, I, I'd uh, like to connect with Secretary French um, so we can review this um, together. We haven't had a chance to actually connect one-on-one -on, -one on this um, because I did have a couple of questions to run by him. Uh, but I believe we're scheduled to be in again next week for testimony as well. Um, but yeah, I, I would just appreciate a chance to, to go over this with him directly. Indeed, we may not have captured early on uh, who you are and who you're working for. So if you would just state your name for the record uh, and the organization that you represent. Sure. My name is Dee Barbic, and I'm Director of Violence Prevention, and I work at the Governor's Office. Great. Thank you. Any other questions regarding this bill? So we will have a new copy. Yes, please. Since we've got Rachel here from um, Legal Aid, do you think we could ask her? Sure. Yeah, her sure. Question? Absolutely. It's a great idea. So for the record again, Rachel yeah, Seeley, Director of the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid. There's a lot in here that makes a lot of sense to us. The section that is actually of greatest concern to me is section 1485, section four. That, uh, page? Uh, page four, starting on line seven. Yep. Which creates these behavioral threat assessment teams. We have significant concern that these will have a disproportionately bad effect on students with disabilities and um, overlap with what's already required by the IDEA, which is to do manifestation determination reviews if a student with a disability um, is potentially being excluded from school for more than 10 days uh, because of a serious behavior. Um, that process, unfortunately, we're seeing ignored in favor of an immediate removal and a requirement for a threat assessment as it currently stands. Um, and this provision would take the responsibility from the IEP team uh, who is meant to develop the plan, create the supports for that student, um, away from the team that knows the child best and put it with people who potentially have never met the child, including law enforcement, which could very well criminalize disability-related behaviors. Um, so this is, this to me, this is why I came to, to sit with you all today is because this oh, is, is a concern <clears throat> for us. And what we've seen around the country when threat assessment teams have been created is exactly what I'm concerned about, which is that they have led to students with disabilities being even further excluded from school because of disability-related behaviors. Thank you for this. Uh, do you have a fix to it, or is it just a, I mean, do you have some language or something, or something that you so think, or is this, go ahead, please. Our, <clears throat> yeah. From our view, the existing law, the manifestation determination review process, could be used before 10 days of exclusion. Right, so if there's a student who's exhibited a behavior yep. um, that might otherwise go to a threat assessment team, what a district can already do or could be required to do at less than 10 days would be to do a manifestation determination review at that point, determine if it's a disability-related behavior, and if it is, not exclude the student, but figure out how to amend the IEP and change the supports in order for that student to be safely accessing their free and appropriate public education. Uh, Ms. Barbic, I don't know if you have any initial <clears throat> response. We will definitely, and please tell me your last name again. Seelig. Seelig. Yes. Uh, Ms. Seelig? Yes. Okay? Ms. Seelig in next week, sure. I think, on Tuesday, so we can flush this out a little bit more. Uh, and because I also just need to understand some of it, and we'll have others weigh in on it. Uh, but I didn't know, uh, Ms. Barbic, if this is something you want to weigh in on. Patient and more from Ms. Seelig. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I would I would appreciate um, more time for next week's testimony, um, just so that I have a better understanding um, as well, um, and then also have a chance to chat with Secretary French. But um, yeah, I would I would appreciate to be able to listen to the the testimony uh, next week, and again, as I mentioned, just to get a better understanding. Right. What I'm going to mention just to get a better understanding. 
Great. What I'm going to ask Ms. Seelig to do, if you would actually draft language, sure. <clears throat> send it to me, Ms. James, uh, Ms. Barvik, uh, as well, just so people have an opportunity to see it over the weekend. Absolutely. Uh, and then come and present. And feel free to copy the entire committee. Okay. Uh, and then we'll have an opportunity to look at it. And then we can jump into it a little bit more on Tuesday. But if you could actually think about your language as it relates to you know this particular section, yeah. as where you would like it, et cetera. That's Sounds like, uh, yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, Ms. Barbic, I was just wondering, in sort of um, on the other side of that equation, would it be possible for us to get some language and or data around the weaknesses of the manifestation determination review? Because it seems like there must have been a problem that was seen with that process to implement the behavioral threat assessment? No, am I not making sense? She's I, giving me a I'm not quite sure I follow. Okay, <clears throat> so it sounds like right now there is a process in place to identify potential threats that's called a manifestation determination review. So I'm assuming someone saw a weakness in that process to be suggesting a new plan called the Behavioral Threat Assessment Teams, and I'm wondering if we can hear more about that. And let me just start with Ms. Selig. So there is, in your opinion, there's something that exists to assess threats like the one we're talking about right now? There, yes, in terms of students with disabilities, there is already a process okay. in place. For students without disabilities, it's absolutely optional, right? The, right? the MDR and the IDEA only apply to students with disabilities who qualify for an IEP. Section 504 provides some other protections yeah. before exclusionary discipline is imposed, um, and I think there's a tremendous overlap between behaviors that may very well lead to exclusionary discipline and some of the very serious behaviors that this bill you know, would propose to, to be able to prepare for and, and prevent. Yeah, and so what I see, and this is just me uh, thinking aloud here, we're trying to you know, assess behaviors that could threaten, of course, yeah. other students, faculty, staff. Yes. And you are saying right now there is a process for that just for students that have a disability. So that strikes me as disturbing in itself. Sure. Yep. So students why? Students with disabilities are also disproportionately yeah. Yeah. subjected to exclusion. Right. You know, anyway. And, and are potentially more likely to be seen as students who may be a risk to their peers because of disability-related behavior. So how long has this been on the books? Uh, at least since the most recent amendment to IDEA, which was in 2008, uh, I believe, but maybe much longer. I mean, the IDEA has been the law of the land since the late So the manifestation years. determination review is out there on the books to determine whether or not students with disabilities are threatening are a threat to other students well, and students faculty staff. Disabilities behavior yep. uh, was a result of their disability. And that may very well be threatening behavior, behavior that might otherwise lead to them being excluded from school. So for example, I'll yeah, maybe please. to make it a little more concrete, um, if a student with a disability says to a teacher, I'm gonna bring a knife and I'm gonna kill you, yeah. right? Like that's one of these serious behaviors. And that is a student who um, has a traumatic brain injury and yeah. therefore doesn't have that filter to be like, oh, I might think something, I have no intention of acting on it, right. but I'm gonna, it's a verbal spew, right? If they, have, if they have an IEP, what's gonna happen is rather than going immediately to suspension or expulsion, yeah. if, the, if the plan would be to, to keep that student out of school for more than 10 days, yeah. or if they've already been suspended so many times that they may be hitting 10 days mm -hmm. in a school year, their IEP team would be required to come together to conduct a manifestation determination review and say, is this a result of the disability? If no, then you can exclude them, you can, you can do whatever you would do to a student with a disability. But if the answer is yes, mm -hmm. then the team needs to say, okay, well, we're gonna return them to their placement, their, their least restrictive environment placement, but what do we need to change in their IEP mm -hmm. to address these behaviors so that this doesn't happen again, or if it, if it might happen, like th that we prevent it from, from getting to the place where it is a real threat. Yeah. So that, that's what would happen to a student with a disability. If a student doesn't have a disability and they say, say I'm gonna bring in a knife and I'm gonna, yeah. you know, then it's very likely that, that they're gonna be facing exclusionary discipline 
because of that threat. And there may be other things that happen beyond just the exclusionary discipline because of that threat. And we've certainly seen that in our schools around, around Vermont and around the country, um, where it doesn't just impact that one student, but like the whole system of you know, making the building tighter or more you know, harder in order to keep people out and that sort of thing does, it does kind of result. But this is the student-focused part of it yeah. that is already addressed through the MDR. So cool. yeah. And I think one of the things that's important to understand is that this is not, in our view, something that is well implemented. So I recently worked with a student whose um, school um, kind of general administrators had never participated in an NBR before, and like were not familiar with the process. And so I think it is. I think there's a training element for administrators as well in making sure this process works for students with disabilities. And I also don't think there's any reason to not have manifestation review for every student. Like, what's going on with the student? Why is this the behavior? Why do we think this student might be a threat? But with people who actually know them and who work with them, rather yeah. than strangers who are, who are unfamiliar with them in the context of their lives. So. Ms. St. James, do you, wanna, do you have anything? I do not have anything to add. OK, OK. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Barbeck, anything to add at this point? I think it seems like there should be a conversation between Ms. Seelig and the agency. On, I'm happy to reach out to the second. Yeah, on, on what, you know, what might be the, the best uh, solution to what seems like. Uh, it's a tricky spot. It's, it's just a little bit of a tricky spot. Yeah, yeah, it's just a little bit of a tricky spot. But I see your point, and, to, and your, your point's a good one. Um, that language would be to make sure that we're all in, in, on the same page. Yeah. And if I, right. if I could, Mr. Chair, um, I think that when we, we're looking at behavioral threat assessments and we've talked, we've heard testimony of, about the multidisciplinary team approach, and really, you know, that's, I think, what's being mentioned here is, is really works hand in hand with the behavioral threat assessment approach in the sense that um, if this were a student with a disability, with the multidisciplinary team um, doing the threat assessment, that would become, it seems to me, fairly immediately um, noticed and, and immediately known. And bringing that, um, you know, the, the special educators or those that are involved in the IEP and such, bring them into that threat assessment because they have a knowledge of that student um, and their IEP if they have one. Um, and so I think that's really when we're looking at the, the multidisciplinary team approach, this is exactly why we're, we're doing that. It's to bring all of these different perspectives in doing the threat assessment. And as was mentioned by Dr. Rondazzo during her testimony, this behavioral threat assessment isn't intended to be a punitive um, tool. It's intended to identify behaviors and then resources that can be um, a bit made available to that student um, to, you know, get them on a better pathway. Right. Sorry, go. Um, Rachel, would it help if um, part of the team had like a special educator, if there was a special educator on the team or a member of an IEP team, would that be helpful, do you think? Um, I would like to think about that a little bit okay. more. Um, okay, so we will look back forward to having you in on Tuesday uh, with a uh, solution. That would be a big help to us. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Great, thank you. Okay, anything else, committee, before we move on? Or Ms. St. James? I am not a part of the committee. But I do have a couple that I just want to say. You are part of the it sounds, um, it sounds like you want to move this very soon. Um, but there are other policy pieces in here that you have not discussed as well as, or we haven't come to a decision on. Okay. As well as um, yesterday we left off on some small non-policy edits. I apologize. Um, I thought the only thing, I was looking for things in green. So yes, let's continue. Okay. There's no, I didn't make these changes. We just didn't have time to talk about them. Great, yesterday. great. Um, the, um, 
School Boards Association. And frankly, I mean, we, we have two weeks. Okay. We're not going to move anything unless okay. it's perfect. Okay, I yes. just want to yes. make sure that yeah. if you want to go through all of the, the, the changes suggested, we haven't done that yet. Let's keep going. Are we on the miscellaneous bill now? Or? No, no, we're on uh, school, safety. school safety. Okay, sorry, I thought we were moving. Um, uh, in section two, the emergency uh, operations plan. The uh, School Boards Association et al. Um, suggests that um, each supervisory union or supervisory district shall, ins um, instead of adopt, they'd like to see the word maintain. I don't have a, I don't have a thought either way on that. Well, if they have one, they'd be maintaining it. But if they don't, they would certainly have to adopt one. So perhaps could, adopt and maintain. Or maintain, yeah. Um, they'd like to see language in all hazards emergency operations plan for each school site that is at least as comprehensive. Uh, line? The 12? Uh, 12. Emergency operation plan that is at least as comprehensive? Um, so they are suggesting, um, so the current language reads emergency operations plan, and they are suggesting right after plan to insert the words for each school site. So it would read, they shall adopt and maintain an all hazards emergency operations plan for each school site that is, that is at least as, etc. Ms. Barbic, I'm looking to you. Um, I again, I don't, uh, I don't think that that would be an issue, but I would like to to confer with Secretary French. That'd be great, and we can then we can hold on that one and have them come back to us on Tuesday. Uh, and then there's a suggestion to. Um, Strike after the word template on line 12. Mm -hmm. Going on to line 13, there's a suggestion to strike maintained and instead insert the word provided. I don't know. I mean, if the template is being sent in a week. Well, uh, maybe D can comment on this, but I, I would imagine this is a living document that gets updated. So maintaining it in recognition of the crisis planning team might be appropriate. I'm inclined to think so too. Because it's going to change over time. Right. Threats change, new threats emerge. And then therefore be maintained. Senator, uh, D. Uh, yes, I think um, maintained, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it is a, a document that is subject to change and I think there is even a section in this um, that requires that the that that document be reviewed annually. Um, so yes, it is something that needs to be maintained. It's not, you know, developed and then considered done forever. So I think maintain is is a, an appropriate word. Let's stick with it. And then there's a suggestion, um, staying on the same line, um, 13, on page 3, and maintained by the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team. I'm sorry, what line? Line 13. Yep. Maintained by the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team is what the bill currently states. Mm -hmm. And there is a suggestion to strike Crisis Planning Team and replace it with Safety Center. And I don't know enough about, uh, I, I don't know if, if that's. I think they might, I'd say we stick with crisis planning team. I think they're thinking uh, safety center, perhaps they're getting confused. There is a Vermont safety center. Yes. Okay, Mr. But, Chair, um, it, I believe the safety center would be appropriate. Okay. Um, and then to go back on what we were talking about before uh, with the um, template provided or maintained. Again, um, I would like to confer with Secretary French on that. Um, 
just to to ensure that we're we're in lockstep on that. Yeah, we've agreed that you'll get back to us on that one also. Thank you, Dee. Um, and then they'd like the last suggestion in the section is to add the word reviewed prior to updated. So if we're at the very end of line 13. Reviewed plan, and updated? Correct. So if we're on the line 13, yep. the plan shall be reviewed and updated Makes on an sense. annual basis. Thank you. Um, and then the last, um, there were, again, other outstanding policy questions, um, but on section four, so that takes us to page four. If I could uh, jump in for a second, um, I did want to point out on line 16 on page three, the Vermont school, it currently reads crisis planning team shall maintain. That's again, the same situation we looked at on line 13, it should read safety center, Thank not um, crisis planning team. Thank you. Um, uh, again, on page four, Section four, there is a suggestion um, on, on line nine. It currently reads, shall appoint a behavioral threat assessment team to be comprised of, um, and I know you're um, Still amending this, this yeah. section, so I don't know if you want me to go into it, but there's a suggestion to strike all of the people the, the team would be comprised of, and um, replace it with following the guidance issued by the Vermont School Safety, Safety Center and the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team. And their note reads, with the requirement to follow guidance from Vermont School Safety Center and the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team, it is not necessary to spell out in law the precise composition of the behavioral threat assessment team. And I don't know enough about the school safety center or the school crisis planning team to have uh, a feeling either way. Ms. Barber, do you mind checking in with the secretary on that one too? Yes, I, yes, will. I will. Great, great. And I, we know Ms. Seeley is also going to be working on this section. Those were the, um, that's the end of the technical changes that we didn't get to or the, the language changes. Yep. Um, we talked about each policy decision as it came up yesterday. I understand the committee's intent is to have the same requirements on approved independent schools yes. as it, and also recognized independent schools or just approved. Can we do that? Because the recognized are... You can do whatever you want. You're the legislature. So recognized, again, there, these are... Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, please. Are you asking me what a recognized... Yes, I'm asking you to remind us... Uh, that the, so recognized. a recognized independent school is um, a school, let me read the definition to you, but it's, it's a private school in Vermont. Yeah. Um, and they have to report to the, um, they have to be recognized by the State Board of Education. And they have some reporting requirements to the State Board of Education. Oh, if they're already reporting things and things like that, yes. then I would say yes, if this is, then absolutely. Yeah. If the draft language only contemplates approved in some places and recognized in others, do you want to keep that? I think we need to be consistent throughout and have recognized and approved all the way through. If they're already reporting things to the state board, yeah. Um, and then it sounds like you're going to have the um, agency in to talk about some of those larger policy questions, like what do they mean by educational institution? Right. Um, and some of the other other items we talked about. So, Hayden, the agency's coming in Tuesday, we're hoping? Thursday. Thursday, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and what, so on Tuesday, we'll have Ms. Seeley again. Yep. Yeah. And you will have spoken with uh, D yes. and the secretary. Could we have D come in on Tuesday also? Yeah. Just so the two of them, right, you know, when yeah. one comes in, we'll have the other come in as well. Um, 
okay, I think next, it's time for a new clean draft, and then we'll pick it up on Tuesday. Yes, the changes again will be very minimal. Absolutely. Okay. The, yeah, the ones that we've discussed, we'll see. Yep. Yeah. Anything else from committee members? It's kind of sausage making time. Uh, Ms. Barbic and Ms. Seelig, thank you so much for spending uh, your time with us today and spending time together on Monday. And we'll look forward to seeing both of you on Tuesday. Sounds good. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Welcome back to Senate Education. Final bit of business today is uh, going through the miscellaneous education bill. Uh, we went through it yesterday with a couple of different uh, advocates, and we have Jeff Fenn with us with the NEA to uh, weigh in today. So, Mr. Fenn, thank you. welcome. Uh, Jeff Fannin, again, uh, from Vermont NEA. Thank you very much for having me. Here to talk about the miscellaneous ad bill. I know I did pay and receive the latest version. Uh, I don't think there are too many dramatic changes such that uh, anything I was prepared to say uh, yesterday would, would alter what I'm saying here today. Uh, as it relates to Section 1, uh, and I'll just say generally the, the State Board of Education, and looking at it, it looks like there's now a study, or, or a, excuse me, a report, or a, a requirement that the HC hire a third party to report or something of that sort. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, I read it very quickly just 15 minutes ago, so I'm a little bit uh, unsure of exactly what it's doing. I do think it makes sense. I, uh, what we're talking about here are volunteer board members. Yeah. We rely on that across the state, whether it be a select board, school board, um, many other boards that we have in the state. And um, we are a small state and not a Vermonter by birth. I married a seventh generation Vermonter. And she would say, it's, um, this is how we've operated many for many years. And uh, the question is whether we should continue to do so. And I think you're, you're asking a very good question. Same with legislators. We've always been a citizen in the legislature. And should you be looking at that and whether they sh uh, you all should be paid. Uh, and it, it makes good sense to look at that. So I, I do support looking at it. Uh, but it is a much larger question. Absolutely. Uh, and so the snapshot of the State Board of Education. You right. also That's our snap. I mean, that's a No, no, actually, that's your, your yeah. failure yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, you might want to look at and add to the, the language. And it just came here as I read it a few minutes ago whether uh, we want them to be appointed by the governor and, or, or, or other states elect them, or do, how do other states do it? And maybe that's something this uh, third party entity could, could at least chart out. Yeah. Seven states do it this way, yeah. 15 do it this way, et cetera. I've had bills, as you probably recall, many times trying to dissolve the state board and uh, trying to, again, kind of get everything under the Secretary of Education. So we could, you know, bring that kind of discussion, um, you know, up again. You know, does it make sense still for us to have a state board, or do we go about it in a in a different way? We yeah. we opposed uh, Vermont NEA opposed many years ago, uh, ten whatever it was about uh, ten moving to a, a secretary of education. Yep. Uh, we thought it it, it made a position too politicized. Yep. Uh, and, and I, I, I stand by that, honestly, and I think that that was good then, and it remains good policy, but, but we are where we are now, and I think taking a look at the State Board as it relates to that overarching question might be, it's, it's a healthy examination. Mr. Fenn, do you remember when John Carroll was the chair of that board, was there some kind of examination that happened during that time around rules and response? Is that what you feel? I don't know. Nothing. Okay. I, do, I don't okay. know. Okay. Um, because it is, it's, it's, it's a great question. I mean, they do, you know, they have a heavy lift, and other, some other boards do also, but it goes back to your point and what we talked about yesterday. How do you get diversity, low-income people, and others on these if you're going to say, hey, come on up? You know, it, you know when they, you just don't have the time. And just yeah, together. right. Do you have the time, the resources? Yeah. Uh, yeah. A per diem yeah. is not going to entice somebody of low means, typically, right? To, to travel exactly. that far yeah. and, yeah. and they uh, just can't put, put yeah. in that time. Right. Yeah. Um, so we want a richer, more diverse. Yeah. State so we'll look at this in terms of you know beefing it up to consider other questions around the state board. Right. 
But you, I mean, I, you don't have to tell me right now, but generally, maybe unless you have the answer, believe the state board still has a role in this state. Uh, I do. I think okay. th they're... I know they do right now. I mean, we could sort of they, send They actually them. still have a role to yeah. play because yeah. you, you still have some uh, rule, making they have rule making and they've yeah. got other responsibilities. Understood. The question is, is that the right entity to do yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, and is the way we appoint them the yeah. right way to do it? Right. Uh, the idea for many years is that we didn't want to politicize education, right. particularly at the state level. Uh, and the question is, have we politicized it too much, too little, not enough? You know, all, all those are good, worthy examination questions. Um, yeah. Because the goal ultimately, and I think we all share, we, we may vary on how we want to get there, but is to educate uh, kids and educate them well, yeah. so that they go out and be productive citizens. Yes. And, and, and thoughtful and intelligent young people and grow up into, you know, good Vermonters. Yeah. It's a long-term goal, it's a long-term investment yeah. is education, and I think we need to look at it that way, and that, and that includes the state board yeah, absolutely. and their role in that. Uh, Sue mentioned the statewide uh, health care. Yeah, uh, so we do it's have... Not, it's not there, is it? I don't... I it's not in the bill. No. No, we'll take separate testimony. We do have what we refer to as orphan language that's sort of floating around, but you, you support that idea? Uh, I think you should, I certainly think you should hear from the two, uh, ch uh, the two chairs. respective sides chairs. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, certainly, um, anyway, so section two, I didn't write that down. Um, Statewide course offerings. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of Act Forty Six. Hmm. Act Forty Six was um, a law that was passed designed to uh, increase educational opportunities. Uh, and, by, and the way it strove to do that was by consolidating governance and, and therefore creating larger governance structures, so that some small schools within the governance structure would have what the larger schools in the same governance structure have. It was to equalize that at some level. And I think it's healthy to look back and see whether Act 46 did that. I surmise it did not. I, I, I think that um, uh, anecdotally I've not heard that smaller schools now are offering uh, German as a foreign language yeah. versus the larger schools that might have previously or something along those lines. So it's a worthy examination. Uh, and, and that includes statewide course offerings. We typically, for my I think that um, schools do offer what their communities want them to offer, and that's important. It gives parents a sense of, uh, of belonging, students a sense of belonging and control of, of their academic uh, future. Uh, I don't know that typically want the state weighing in on curriculum, and that's what this is essentially looking at, and that's a, uh, something we've not been fond of in the past. Yeah, maybe, I mean, what I'm trying to get to a little bit just to guide work in the future for this committee is that that one, and I get it, one horrible example of the kid that didn't get into UVM because there was in the third year of math. What else is out there? How can we as just, you know, I always feel like sitting in this chair and I haven't been there this that long, but a real understanding of what's happening out there and what students are getting and what they're not and what they're being offered. So that's kind of it. And I think your point's a great one about Act 46. Even in my own district, I had hoped that the five elementary schools would end up with one school board so that you could switch teachers around, switch kids around, just more of that kind of flexibility and get more offerings, greater equity. And I don't think that's happened. I don't think so. I mean, I think that, you know. Yeah. Maybe it has in some areas, but I, I can just speak to it. It was introduced as an educational opportunity bill. Yeah. And uh, I think there was a quiet murmur in the building that it was a way to cost save. Yeah. And, and, and that has been the focus. Well, I don't know, A, if it has been a cost savings. I don't know. Nobody's yeah. looked at it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that was the overarching concern, but it was the, uh, a rumble in the building at the time. Definitely. And certainly the stated goal of Act 46 was to make sure that we, all kids had uh, a more equalized educational opportunity uh, systems in place. And nobody's looked at whether that has happened. And I think that um, 
that's something that, that could be examined. So I think right. before you go into uh, taking a look at uh, statewide course offerings, maybe we, we stop and look at what Act, what Act 46 has offered to change and alter. Uh, and, and, uh, and frankly, I think Jay and Sue said this both, uh, I am concerned about the AOE's capacity to yeah. do that kind of work. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to have them in. I wonder if there's a way to kind of connect both a little bit, because what you're saying is very similar to, I think, the goal there is what has Act 46 produced and what hasn't it produced. And yeah, okay, let me work on some language that might incorporate both. It was a big change. Yeah, for, yeah. for many places. Yeah, uh, yeah. Some were reluctant. Yeah. Uh, I know I you know, recently talked with my counterparts in Maine, and they were 10 years ahead of Vermont and school governance consolidation. And now they've gone back and there have been uh, some uh, divorces, if you will, over in Maine. And, and uh, is that good or bad? I don't know, but you know, we're behind them in the timeline of that and maybe we could talk to our friends in Maine. It's a good idea. Yeah. 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 What was that? Learn by their mistakes. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. wait 10 more years. Yeah. But again, I think it's that AOE capacity, yep. which I'm concerned about. Uh, if I could interject please, yeah. the, the question more for the chairman, uh, potentially. Uh, so with this section two, would you consider uh, it being refocused towards an, uh, a review of the, uh, kind of the results of Act 46 and the uh, Absolutely. It, its effect on statewide course? Offering? Absolutely. Absolutely, I think they, and I do think they're connected, and it would be really interesting to see if anything else came, that if things improved. It's a heavy lift for the agency, one way or the other, but they could always farm it out. I mean, one of the things I struggle with is, you know, we, we don't, we get out, we all see, our, we probably all visit our own schools all the time, we do different things, but really having a grasp on what's happening out there is hard for legislators, and so if we could combine the two of them, I think it makes sense. Um, could not agree more. Yeah, yeah, okay. I yeah. heard a term I haven't ever heard before. Um, I'm meeting with Beth this afternoon a little bit so we can work on it. A look back. So somebody said that they didn't support a bill because it didn't have a look back. Yeah. Is that something we could incorporate, like Act 46? What we're talking about right now is looking back at what the intent was and what it actually accomplished, and if it didn't do what it was supposed to. We do have some school districts that are pulling out of that course. Right, right, you know, yeah, so. yeah. The only time I've seen a look back, I know Senator Kitchell's working on one with S5 that, you know, so that people can sort of get a sense of, I'm not sure if it's really a look back as much of a, I'm not sure if the term really right. Describes. I, what I it don't does. understand the term. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. oh no results. Right. Yeah, no results. Intent. Do we make a change? It's a metric. Yeah. And sometimes the results are it did. It's successful. Right. right. Or did it didn't. You learn. Right. Anyway. Okay. Continue on in uh, section three. So, it's a theme yeah. here, perhaps. Uh, Yesterday, I think you talked to Sue and Jay about Act 77 yep. um, and PBGRs, and yep. I think the same could be said there about reviewing uh, all the success of that. So Act 46 and, and, and Act 77, and Act 77 is the personal learning plan, is dual enrollment, in PBGRs. Yep. What has been the success uh, of that? Uh, have we seen Yeah, that? it's been 10 years. I think yeah. you're right. I think it's a good time to do it, yeah. Well, if I, if I remember the testimony, uh, correctly, she thought it might be too early still. And I'm yeah, for PBGRs, I think that's right. Because uh, I think Jay was the one who also said that it was PBJR. Uh, proficiency based grading. No, she term. thought it had only been in place for four years, and then we realized it had been in place for 10 years. Correct, but Jay also said, I think it was Jay, uh, it could have been Sue, it could have been both of them, yeah. <laughs> um, that uh, last year's senior class or the year before were the first ones who okay. came up through. Uh, that system from start to finish, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so um, we do have, we're starting to build uh, potentially some linear data about that. So it, it may be early, but it may not be too late to start collecting the data mm -hmm. and seeing uh, 
finding out how you want to collect the data. Right? I mean, part of this would be, I don't know how they would collect the data, what would be the tangible yeah. uh, things to collect and helpful, but to start to do it now when it's fresh in everybody's mind. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not, you know, somebody who's in the school like would yeah. say, yeah. I, I remember how we used to do it, yeah. this is how we're doing it now. You heard yeah. from your constituent uh, teacher, Megan Morgan, Lucy, who said yeah. she's carrying two. Uh, you talk to any teacher that works in this building in Vermont. Yeah. Right. <laughs> carrying two grade books. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I don't think any, that was anybody's intention yeah. Yeah. or, or yeah. hope that teachers right. would have two grade books. Right, I know. Um, it seems a little bit uh, inconsistent yeah. with, with the, the goal, I would say. It is true. You know, you hate to just rely on test scores, you know. And but that could be one of the things that they could pull apart. How else could we, you know, find get a sense of whether or not this is this is working or making a difference? We know well, graduation rates, maybe, and stuff like that. Like, well, I think even better is we know we have a high graduation rate, but we know that the remediation issue is huge for CCB and the state colleges. It's well, no, so that's a fact. I will. I mean, unless you want to have Joyce Judy and you know, I mean. That is what we hear all the time, even from UVM. Right. Um, so it's one thing. The question is, you know, you can have a lot of ninety percent of kids graduate on time, but what are they graduating with? It's a very important question. Would you agree? I, I think it is important to, to find out. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but equally important is why why are we graduate what about seven or so thousand kids a year? Yeah. In the state, uh, half of whom go to college. Mm -hmm. You're talking about 3,500 kids. Why yeah. the other half? What are they doing? Yeah. Uh, so I fear part of it is because we have not adequately prepared them. Prepared them or financed them? Uh, maybe both. Yeah. For what goal? For whatever goal they want to actually meet, whether it's go on to you know higher education, the trades, go into the workforce. I mean, nothing's point. you know, the scores we see we know are dismal and unsatisfactory. And then if you talk to, you know, they're, they're, then if you talk to the institutions of higher ed, they also have this concern. So I'm not sure where, I'm happy to look at a bright light if you've got something there. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll think about that. And, and, yeah. uh, and then I, you know, and this is something we could find out about Act 77. You get really motivated kids, but what about the low-income kids? Are they really benefiting right, and that, from Act and, 77? And that's been the, the find criticism some of that dual out. enrollment. Yeah, right. That it was just uh, that it has just been helping the kids who would get that otherwise. Who would do that yeah. otherwise? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. I will add some language to that and bring it back to the committee. That's um, a good idea. Section four, remote teacher grant program. Yeah. Uh, this gets me back, we've talked about this, the Vermont Virtual Learning Co-op. Yeah, and you know, we might pull this, I just keep it here just to make sure we don't lose sight of it. We, you, ha you were the one who recommended the two teachers come in, they were great. Seems like there's a lot of good stuff happening out there already. I just wanna make sure the kid in, you know, our lowest income districts are just have the same thing. And, and uh, some of that could be figured out, I think, during the earlier study, and that's what I'm hoping. If, you know, sure, Mount Anthony Union High School, I think, probably has more offerings because of its size and and some of its financial ability than sure. some other areas. Yeah, and so I, I don't know what that will look like by the time we vote on this in a couple of weeks. But I'm just kind of keeping it there as a placeholder to see. Do I talk to Kitchell and say, hey, do we just make five hundred thousand dollars available? or add somewhere to make sure that if it's a low-income district, the teachers can kind of not go around their school board, or but say, okay, we can get these funds because we really need these funds because Sarah really needs that, I don't know, AP class or Correct. whatever. Yeah. I, so one of the ways I think it's being done now is through the Vermont Virtual Learning Co-op. Yeah. Uh, so VTVLC doesn't, um, yeah, you can talk with Jeff Renard, who is the, the principal or head of school, I don't know what the technical term is, just title. Um, but they, they they have partner schools who are in Vermont. Yeah. Uh, and and those schools enjoy benefits by being a partner school with VTVLC. Uh, they get seats so their kids can take a class if, yeah. if, if 
uh, the name you used, whoever she is or they are, uh, would be able to take it through through no charge whatsoever to their home school. Uh, so, so, Jeff, do you think you, whole, you don't see yeah, now. yeah? So, I mean, I'm happy to if you don't see that there's really a problem out there right now with kids accessing it. You know, I'm okay with pulling it. It's, I, I, I do worry about over reliance on remote learning, right? Well, one yeah, of the things we learned yeah. in the in the pandemic is yeah. there is no substitute for in person right, teaching, right? None. And and so to the extent we have a system that's in place since before the pandemic, which is VTVLC, yeah, that grew pretty dramatically during the early right. years of the year years of the pandemic, yeah, uh, and is continuing on. It's a well established program in the state. Yeah, seems to be working, and and it would be good to hear from them directly. Do you need to expand it? Are they, are you hearing stories of, of students in smaller, more rural places, right. not getting what they need, or are you able to meet their needs? Right. And and uh, no, I, I, I think it's a great idea. I don't know the answer to that, yeah. but I think you ought to hear from them. Yeah, and for me, it's you know, it's as you know, it's particularly hard right now to find teachers and moving somewhere and finding a house and you're not going to hire one person to move somewhere just to teach a couple classes of calculus. So that's what, it's sort of that unique moment, but I agree with you in terms of virtual versus uh, in person. That being said, there are kids that are also going to be just more comfortable sometimes doing virtual. They're getting bullied, they're, you know, so all those options are important. Right. Sorry, we, we, well, I'm sorry. No, I, I just want yeah. to say we did. We do know that you're right that, that some kids did better in a remote environment early in the pandemic. Yeah, there's a small number, but but should we meet with you know that their needs? Yes. And so yeah. again, I, I'll, I'll fall back to sound like a broken record. I think VTVLC could do that. Yeah, and it is doing it. It was doing it before the pandemic. Right. Um, okay. I don't know. Great, yeah, we've heard great things. Yeah, Sarah, go ahead. I, I just want to reiterate what Mr. Bannon is saying. VTVLC is amazing. Yeah. I, I can't, as, as a parent, my son couldn't get a physics course. He wanted physics. He was able to take it through VTVLC because we had a teacher who was teaching, so we got those credits. And then as a librarian, I had students who needed a class that Essex High School wasn't offering, and they were able to take that class during the school day and I would, when I was the librarian, I would let them come to the library and I sort of became their mentor in a way, just, just to give them a space to sit so they could do their work and, you know. Um, so that's another option, like I, they were being taught by someone who wasn't in our building, but we had the space and we had an adult available and we made it work and it was just, it was just phenomenal. Um, and then we also had a Spanish teacher at Essex High School who taught Spanish, so we got credits in our school to be able for our kids to be able to take courses, which was really nice. Yeah, it was great. You you've done BTL, the virtual. I've done VHS. I don't VHS. Know. Yeah, VHS. Okay. I don't know what the difference is. Okay. Maybe pull up some information if you don't mind. We can look at the you know Vermont Learning Center, Vermont Learning Center, VLC. Uh, uh, Virtual high school, Vermont virtual high Vir school. VT VLC was the Vermont Virtual Learning okay. Co-op. Co okay. The VHS is uh, virtual high school. I think it is. I'm not, not national organization. Yeah. yeah, I'm gonna ask Caden to dig up some info on the one that you mentioned and just send it around to everybody. Okay. Uh, Great. Uh, section five. Yeah. Appropriation for higher ed marketing. Yeah. Uh, what I would say was not why not for all education. Um, I remember years ago. Um, Betsy Bishop and I were chatting. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, I don't know if you've ever been up the interstate on a Friday on during the winter. Senator Gulick, you're probably zipping up every Friday about this time, and you'll I notice think we're all what, on the interstate. Wh where are the interstates? In the state? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you probably have it a little bit different in, in, in and around Rutland, but they're heading yeah. up the mountain road to Killington. Uh, I think of Stowe and Sugarbush at. You know, getting off, the, you know, heading north in the interstate from here uh, at the Stowe Waterbury exit, it's backed up onto the interstate. Yeah. Right? And if you've ever done a Friday night on the same route, my, my in laws live north of Burlington, so we, we occasionally drive up there and you'll see people in their, their cars, the blue light in the back, the kids are watching a movie or something like that, and they're all heading up to the slope for the weekend. And, and I said to Betsy, why aren't we grabbing 10% of them? 10% mm -hmm. of those people. 
uh, and some marketing program at every sugar at, at every ski area in the state. Uh, and you know, I always thought, well, pay teachers, you know, some sort of stipend to do it on a Saturday morning to touch touch base with these these parents, or bring their kids up every weekend to ski in Vermont. Uh, and we're going to end up being one of the few places where you can ski in the, in the not too distant future, sadly. Uh, but getting them to stay here, they're able to work remote. It's even more yeah, true before the right. pandemic. That's right. Yeah. The, the Betsy and I were chatting. Now, during the, after the pandemic, these people can work from anywhere. And why not have 10% of them? If we just touched and spoke and, and conversed with 10% of them on the chair looked up or in the lodge grabbing a hot chocolate and got them to stay, uh, not just for Saturday and Sunday, but but year round. Yeah. Uh, so you know, using money to market for the, the hot, for higher ed, I think is good, but also for for K twelve as well, and frankly for the entire state. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Well, one of the things that was interesting that we learned just you know, such a tiny, tiny little marketing budget, mm -hmm. pathetic, three million. And some of the campaigns, I think, you know, other states, you know, hey you could live here and all that sort of thing. And I'm sure we've captured some over the years. You know, Senator Hashim talks about his trip up here the first time, just loving it and, you know, wanting to stay here and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm yeah. not close to it. It just yeah, yeah, no, expanded. I, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah. when we have our beautiful new schools, we can yeah. put those on the, on the glossy mm -hmm. Right, brochures. renovated old schools. And or... And yeah, the right. <laughs> but but that, that does get to the point. The school construction point is, is absolutely true. If you drive 15 minutes uh, out to East Montpelier Elementary School, it's a beautiful school. It's, it's yeah. gorgeous, overlooks the Groton Range. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, bring somebody up here and show them that school uh, that's been rehabilitated uh, and, and nicely so. Yeah. It, it is idyllic. And who would not want their kid to go to that school? Uh, it's oh, really there's nice. so many. Yes, and we do have a lot of those schools. Yeah. And and but then unfortunately we have other schools where they're in a, in a department store. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. And that's that's of concern. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. That learning is. environment is it not is. conducive to learning. I would say in no. many cases. And we did look, as you know, you know, now what eight weeks ago early on, if you look at our peers in New England. In New Jersey, New York, mm -hmm. we're not knocking it out of the park. So somebody might say, "Well, my kid's getting a better education in New York or New Jersey. Might as well stay." You know, it might not be the appeal. That's all. You know. Fair enough, but I would say that's throwing in the towel for us to. to no, I do agree. That. But so we can't I'm not market it without getting the, everything kind of up where everybody else is. Here's what I would say. I mean, uh, could we be doing better? Yes. Are we doing really well? Yes. And I think uh, we're, you know. Top five in just about every category that you can think of as compared to our peers. Are we, uh, yeah, I, I think we are, um, and have been for some time, and I worry that we're slipping. I do worry that we're slipping. Um, and so, you know, infrastructure is important. Yeah, yeah infrastructure really is. Huge. Yeah. yeah, Massachusetts huge. has a huge. ton of their schools. Yeah, huge. Jersey does too, I know. think. They've got so yeah. much money too. Yeah. So anyway, I, I think we should be marketing for higher ed. For K-12, for the state generally, and 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 uh, you know, I've said this before in this community, it's it's, it's, yeah. it's 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 maybe tired at this point. But my father used to say, "Look, we're too poor to be cheap." Yeah. Uh, and we've got to invest yeah. in the long-term health and vitality of the state. Yeah. Um, You're fair. Yeah. And that, that no, we have no choice. Yeah. Uh, Section six, pre-K. Uh, again, not lower the standards. I think suits yeah. for that yeah. well. Uh, the only thing I would add is uh, I'm a fan of and, and hearing from my members play based yeah. uh, pre K. Yeah. We've got to focus more on play. So are we. These are young kids. Yeah. Uh, we're not sitting there uh, drilling them. Mm -hmm. So while we're on that topic, has Jeff or has uh, uh, Jay Nichols talked to you about being part of uh, yes. that group? Okay. Yes, I just Great. I know everybody's swamped, but yeah, if, if you could just weigh in and if all of you could bring some pre K language to us. I think health and welfare, I think I was looking at their schedule, they're going to try to vote S56 out. Of course, it's going to have to go to two other committees, I think, after that. Finance, probably, and approach, so we have a little time, but they're going to want to attach something. I'm guessing that's going out next week. So you, you, Maybe. Yeah, you've tasked Jay. He is yeah. on the task. Great, great. Yeah. Just so you know. Okay. 
So like thank the, you the for week that. after. Yeah. Uh, week after that. Tell me again. Okay. Section Great. seven. Uh, I don't. Uh, there's a library. Uh, some, yeah. What you know, page is that on? Oh, Seventeen. Page. Seventeen. Uh, I would just say uh, we ought to be uh, protect librarians from firearms. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you remember this library study? We passed it out of this committee two years ago that looked at a bunch of things as it relates to libraries. That we're getting a report back, I think they said December. And we just thought, okay, while you're looking at everything, take a look at this as well. It's a big conversation in this committee. Uh, we were remote. Um, I don't remember. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll be sincere. I think uh, it came from Senator Bray. Um, and so we're kind of just looking at all the libraries and kind of coming back with a report to the legislature, just given everything that's changing. And so we thought, while you're doing that, this is more municipal libraries, as I. It was all municipal libraries. Okay. Yeah, all municipal libraries. I don't think it included school libraries, anything like that. So it's just kind of the state of the libraries it, themselves. And we had the state librarian uh, and a bunch of other people in. So the report's going, it's moving. We're supposed to get something back in December. And so while it's, they're kind of all sitting around the table working out, we thought we'd send them this little thing to look at as well. Uh, about the firearm piece. Firearms, yeah. yeah. And then they could report back. We don't need firearms in libraries. We right. need more libraries. We support, my support libraries uh, without guns. So, so in that regard, though, page 19, line 3, uh, paragraph 5, isn't, isn't that then kind of a duplicate of what you just outlined of, of the report due in December? Line 5. The current overall. I, if this is current law. Oh, well, yeah, so if it's oh, not underlined, yeah, yeah. it's current law. So she just probably just plopped yeah, it in there. Right. Yeah, that way. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, no, I get it. Yes. So what she did add was on page 21. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. All. So I will meet with Beth and try to get some language around uh, some of the Act 77 and Act 46 stuff and bring it back to committee. But this is getting meaty and it feels good.